It was the kind of back road no one had a reason to drive down unless they were lost or running from something. I'd been doing long hauls for 15 years, so I knew most roads in this part of the country like the back of my hand. But this stretch was new to me. I was following a detour sign, the kind slapped up by road crews who didn't seem to know one end of a map from the other. My dispatcher, Roy, had warned me about the ongoing construction on the main highway, but I'd figured it wouldn't be too much trouble. I was wrong. The trees here leaned in close to the road, branches nearly scraping the top of my rig. I'm not one to get spooked easily, but there was something off about this place. Maybe it was the way the asphalt seemed to ripple under the weight of my tires, or how the daylight struggled to filter through the dense canopy of branches above. I kept one hand on the wheel and the other on the radio, half expecting Roy to crackle through with some emergency reroute, but it stayed dead silent. My name's Carl Haskins, by the way. I've been hauling freight for almost as long as I can remember, seen just about everything there is to see on the road. Had my fair share of close calls, too. Slick roads, sleepy drivers, and a couple of real nasty ones where I'm surprised I walked away in one piece. But this was different. This wasn't some idiot drifting into my lane or a patch of black ice. This was something else. I was about an hour into the detour when I noticed the car. It was a beat-up sedan, something from the 90s, parked on the shoulder with the hood popped open. The front end was smashed up like it had taken a bad hit from something. I slowed down as I approached, more out of habit than anything else. You see a lot of stranded vehicles on these routes, but this one didn't sit right with me. I glanced over as I rolled past. The driver was standing next to the car, a man in his late forties, with thinning hair and a gut that hung over the waistband of his dirty jeans. He wasn't waving me down, wasn't even looking my way, just standing there, staring into the woods like he was waiting for something to come out. I don't pick up hitchhikers. Not anymore. Learned that lesson the hard way when I was younger and dumber. But this guy... There was something about him that made my skin crawl. I couldn't put my finger on it, but I kept my foot on the gas and let the rig pull away from him, leaving him and his busted car in the dust. Maybe five minutes later, I saw another car on the side of the road. This one was an old station wagon, the kind that had long since fallen out of favor. Same story. The front end was crumpled, hood up, but no driver in sight. The thing that got me was how the damage looked exactly the same as the sedan back up the road, like it had been hit by the same thing. I don't know why I did it, but I pulled over this time. Something wasn't right, and I figured I might as well take a closer look. Besides, if there was some lunatic out here running cars off the road, I wanted to know what I was up against. I grabbed the flashlight from the glove compartment and hopped out of the cab. The air was thick, humid, with the kind of stillness that makes you think twice about breathing too deep. I walked around to the front of the station wagon, shining the light over the hood. The damage wasn't just similar, it was identical. Same pattern of dents, same cracks in the windshield. The hell? I was about to turn back when I heard it, a faint rustling in the trees, like something big was moving through the underbrush. I pointed the flashlight toward the sound, and that's when I saw him. The man from the sedan, standing just at the edge of the woods, barely visible in the shadows. He didn't say anything, just watched me, his eyes locked on mine. Hey! I shouted, taking a step toward him. You need help or something? He didn't move, didn't blink, just stared at me with this look that made my stomach twist into knots. I took another step, but something inside me screamed to stop. That's when I noticed it his hands. They were covered in blood, dripping down onto the ground. I backed up, almost tripping over my own feet, and made a beeline for the truck. I wasn't sticking around to find out what kind of crazy this guy was. As I scrambled back into the cab and slammed the door shut, I glanced in the side mirror. He was still there, but now he was closer, just standing in the middle of the road, hands outstretched like he was inviting me to come back. I floored it, the engine roaring to life as I shot down the road. My heart was pounding in my chest, and I couldn't shake the image of that man, those bloody hands. I kept looking in the mirror, half expecting to see him chasing after me, but the road stayed empty. I don't know how long I drove, but it felt like hours. The trees never seemed to thin out, the road never straightened. 
It was like I was stuck in some endless loop, driving through the same stretch over and over. My mind started playing tricks on me, showing me glimpses of movement in the trees, flashes of light that weren't there. Then, out of nowhere, my headlights caught something up ahead, a figure standing in the middle of the road. I slammed on the brakes, tires screeching as the truck skidded to a stop just a few feet from him. It was the same man. Same dirty jeans, same blood-covered hands. I didn't wait this time. I grabbed the tire iron from under the seat and jumped out of the cab, ready to put this nightmare to bed. But as I stepped out, he turned and started walking away, back into the woods. I followed him, keeping my distance but not letting him out of my sight. The trees closed in around us, the road disappearing behind me. My gut told me this was a bad idea, but I couldn't stop myself. I had to know where he was leading me. We walked for what felt like miles, the trees growing thicker and darker with each step. I kept thinking about how this guy had ended up out here, what he'd done to end up with blood on his hands. The air got colder, the ground softer, like we were getting close to some swamp or marsh. Finally, he stopped. We were in a small clearing surrounded by trees so dense they blotted out the sky. He turned to face me, and for the first time I saw his face clearly. It was blank, expressionless, like he wasn't even really there. And then I saw the bodies. There were three of them, laid out in the middle of the clearing, like some kind of sick display. Two men and a woman, all of them with their throats slit, the blood pooling around them in the dirt. My heart stopped, and I felt bile rise in my throat. I looked back at the man, and he just stared at me, that same empty look in his eyes. I don't know what came over me, but I swung the tire iron at him with all the strength I had. It connected with a sickening thud, and he went down, hitting the ground hard. I didn't stop. I kept swinging, over and over, until I was sure he wasn't getting back up. My hands were shaking, my breath coming in ragged gasps. When I finally stopped, I looked down at what was left of him. The blood. The broken bones. It was all real. I stumbled back to the truck, leaving the bodies where they lay. I didn't care about the road anymore. Didn't care about anything except getting out of there. I climbed into the cab, started the engine, and drove. The trees finally began to thin, and before long I was back on the main highway, the nightmare of that place fading into the distance. When I pulled into the next truck stop, I walked straight to the payphone and called the cops, told them everything, where they could find the clearing, the bodies. They showed up a couple of hours later, and I led them back to the spot. The bodies were still there, just like I said. They took my statement, told me I did the right thing. But as they loaded the man's body into the back of the coroner's van, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was still wrong, something I'd missed. The next morning I was back on the road, another hall, another town. But every time I close my eyes, I see that man's face, that blank expression, and those bodies in the clearing. I don't know who he was, don't know why he did what he did, and I don't think I ever will. But I'm still here, still driving. That's all that matters. I've been driving trucks for most of my life. Name's Hank Zoller. Grew up in a small town where working with your hands was just what you did. Never been one for fancy titles or cushy office jobs. I liked the open road, the hum of the engine, and the ever-changing scenery outside my window. It's a simple life, but it's mine. I was on a run through a stretch of highway that most folks wouldn't even know existed. One of those routes where the landscape doesn't change for miles, and you can go hours without seeing another soul. The company I work for takes contracts that most others won't touch, remote deliveries to out-of-the-way places. The pay's good, though, and I'm not one to shy away from a long haul, so I take them. It was early evening, and the sky was beginning to dim. I had a shipment of canned goods and hardware supplies bound for a small town nestled deep in the Ozarks. A place called Harrisville blink, 
and you'd miss it. The road was narrow and winding, cutting through dense forest that seemed to press in on either side. Not much traffic out this way, just me and the road. I'd been driving for about five hours when I noticed something strange. There was a beat-up sedan parked on the side of the road. It was odd, given how desolate the area was. People didn't usually break down out here. They didn't even come out here unless they had a damn good reason. I slowed down, glancing at the car as I passed. The driver's side door was open, but there was no one inside. Just an empty car with its hazards flashing. I didn't think much of it at first. Probably someone who'd walked off to get help. But a mile down the road, I saw another car. This one was a pickup truck, older model, with the hood popped open. Again, no one in sight. Just sitting there, abandoned. Now I've been on enough long hauls to know when something isn't right. And this? This wasn't right. Two abandoned vehicles on the same stretch of road? I slowed the rig down to a crawl, keeping an eye out for anything unusual. My instincts were on high alert. Something was off. As I rounded a bend, I spotted movement up ahead. A figure, walking in the middle of the road. I flicked on my high beams, and that's when I saw him. A tall man, broad-shouldered, wearing a tattered flannel shirt and jeans that looked like they'd been dragged through the mud. His hair was a mess, matted and unkempt, and he was walking with a strange, loping gait. I laid on the horn, expecting him to move, but he didn't. He just kept walking, slow and deliberate, right down the center of the road. I swerved to avoid him, barely missing the ditch on the side. As I passed, I got a good look at his face. It was dirty, with streaks of something dark, maybe blood, across his cheeks. His expression was blank, almost like he wasn't really there. My heart was pounding as I drove on, putting distance between me and the stranger. I'd heard stories about people getting jumped on remote roads, but this guy didn't seem like your average highwayman. There was something more to it, something I couldn't quite put my finger on. A few miles later, I saw another figure. This one was lying in the middle of the road. I slammed on the brakes, the truck shuddering to a stop just a few feet from the body. It was a man, lying face down in the dirt. His clothes were torn, and he wasn't moving. I grabbed the flashlight from the glove compartment and stepped out of the cab. The night air was cool, but I was sweating. I approached the body cautiously, scanning the area for any sign of movement. My pulse quickened as I got closer. The man's back was covered in what looked like deep cuts, his shirt soaked through with blood. I knelt down, feeling for a pulse, but there was nothing. He was dead. That's when I heard it, a rustling in the bushes off to the side of the road. I snapped the flashlight toward the sound the beam cutting through the darkness. My breath caught in my throat as I saw him again, the same man I'd passed earlier, standing at the edge of the tree line watching me. There was no mistaking it this time. His clothes were the same, his face streaked with dirt and blood, but his expression had changed. He was smiling now, a twisted grin that sent a chill down my spine. He didn't move, just stood there, that smile never leaving his face. I backed away slowly, not taking my eyes off him. My truck was only a few feet away, but it felt like miles. I could feel his gaze on me, that predatory stare. My mind was racing, trying to figure out what the hell was going on. Who was this guy? What did he want? I made it back to the truck and climbed into the cab, locking the doors behind me. I fumbled with the keys, my hands shaking as I started the engine. The man was still there, standing at the edge of the road, watching me with that damn grin. I floored it, the tires kicking up gravel as I sped away. For the next hour, I kept the pedal to the floor, not daring to look back. My mind was a mess, trying to make sense of what I'd seen. Part of me wondered if I should have called the cops, but another part of me just wanted to get the hell out of there. I finally reached Harrisville just after midnight. The town was quiet the streets empty. I pulled into the loading dock of the small general store where I was supposed to drop off the goods. The owner, an older man named Dale, was waiting for me. You're late, he said as I climbed out of the truck. Everything okay? I hesitated, not sure how to explain what had happened. Saw some strange things on the road, I said finally. 
A couple of cars abandoned and a guy walking around. Something wasn't right. Dale's expression darkened. You saw him, didn't you? I frowned. You know who I'm talking about? He nodded slowly. Yeah, we've heard about him. Some folks call him the Road Man. He shows up from time to time, usually after dark. People who see him... Well, they don't usually come back to tell the tale. Is this some kind of local legend? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. Dale shook his head. No legend. He's real, and he's dangerous. A few years back, a couple of hunters went missing in those woods. All they found were their rifles and a lot of blood. Last year, a family's car broke down on that same stretch of road. They were never seen again. My stomach churned. What the hell is he? Dale shrugged. No one knows. Some say he's just a man who went mad out there. Others think he's something worse. But one thing's for sure. You're lucky to be standing here right now. I didn't know what to say. The whole thing felt surreal, like a nightmare I couldn't wake up from. I finished unloading the truck in silence, my mind still racing. Dale didn't press for details, and I didn't offer any. When I was done, I climbed back into the cab, ready to put Harrisville behind me. But before I left, Dale handed me a small revolver. Take this, he said, just in case. I nodded, tucking the gun into the glove compartment. I didn't believe in ghosts or monsters, but after what I'd seen, I wasn't taking any chances. As I drove out of town, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being followed. The road stretched out before me, dark and empty. I kept the revolver close, my eyes scanning the rearview mirror every few seconds. But I never saw him again. I made it back to the main highway by morning, the first rays of sunlight breaking through the trees. The events of the night before felt distant, like a bad dream that fades with the dawn. But the revolver was still in the glove compartment, a cold reminder that it had all been real. I finished the delivery route without incident and returned to the depot later that afternoon. The dispatcher gave me my next assignment, a route through the plains, far from the Ozarks and that cursed road. I took it without hesitation. I didn't tell anyone else about what happened. It's not the kind of thing people believe unless they see it for themselves. But I know what I saw, and I won't forget it. The roadman is out there, somewhere, waiting for the next unlucky soul to cross his path. It was a Tuesday morning, and my back hurt like hell. I'd been driving trucks for almost 15 years, hauling everything from livestock to lumber across the Midwest. My name's Frank Devlin, and if there's one thing I know, it's how to keep a rig moving, even when your body wants to call it quits. That day, I had a load of prefab houses to deliver to a new development just outside of Cairo, Illinois, a small town that never made headlines and probably never would. The route was straightforward enough, but... Something about it made my skin crawl, though I couldn't quite put my finger on why. I've seen all kinds of things on the road. Odd accidents, strange folks wandering the highways, and more late-night weirdness than I care to remember. But this job paid well, and the sooner I got it done, the sooner I could rest. I pulled onto a narrow two-lane road, the kind where the trees seemed to close in on you like an unwelcome embrace. It was supposed to be a shortcut, a way to shave off an hour of driving. My dispatcher swore by it, and I trusted him, so I kept going. After about 30 miles, I came to a rusted-out bridge that looked like it had been there since the Civil War. The sign said it was safe, but as I crossed it, I could feel the boards creaking under the weight of my truck. I glanced out the window and saw nothing but dense forest and a river that was more sludge than water. I'd driven over plenty of sketchy bridges before, but this one gave me a bad feeling. A few miles later, I noticed a beat-up pickup truck in my rearview mirror. It was following too close, its headlights practically glued to my bumper. I figured it was some local in a hurry, so I slowed down to let him pass. But instead of going around me, the truck kept pace, sticking to me like a shadow. 
I got a good look at the guy when we hit a straight stretch. He was a big man, maybe 6'5", with a thick neck and a buzz cut that made him look like he'd just gotten out of the military. But there was something off about him. His skin was pale, almost gray, like he hadn't seen the sun in years. He had on a dirty, sleeveless flannel, and his arms were covered in what looked like homemade tattoos, the kind you might see on someone who's done hard time. He wasn't smiling. I tried to shake him off by speeding up, but he matched my every move. That's when I started to get nervous. This wasn't some random driver. He was following me, and he was doing it on purpose. I reached for my cell to call dispatch, but there was no signal. Just my luck. I told myself I'd find a gas station or a diner and lose him there. But the further I drove, the more isolated the road became. It was like this guy knew the route better than I did. Finally, I saw a small rest area up ahead. It was little more than a gravel pull-off with a couple of picnic tables and a bathroom that probably hadn't been cleaned in years, but it was something. I pulled in, hoping he'd just keep going, but he didn't. The truck stopped behind me, blocking my exit. The man got out and started walking toward me. His gait was slow, deliberate, like he had all the time in the world. I locked the doors and stared straight ahead, hoping he'd just go away but he didn't. He walked right up to my window and knocked on the glass, a slow, heavy thud that sent a chill down my spine. I rolled the window down just a crack, enough to talk, but not enough for him to reach inside. Can I help you? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. He didn't answer right away. He just stared at me, his lips curling into a sneer. You're not from around here, are you? He finally said. His voice is rough as gravel. No, just passing through, I replied, keeping my eyes on his hands. They were massive, with thick fingers that looked like they could snap a man's neck without much effort. You got a long way to go, he said, his tone menacing. These roads, they're tricky. Folks get lost out here, disappear. I didn't like where this was heading. I'll manage, I said, trying to end the conversation. He chuckled, a low, humorless sound. You got a load on that truck. Mind if I take a look? That set off every alarm bell in my head. Sorry, can't do that. Company policy. His expression darkened. Company policy don't mean shit out here. He leaned in closer, and I could smell the stench of sweat and stale beer on his breath. I said, open the back. I'd had enough. I reached under the seat for the tire iron I kept there, just in case. I'm not opening anything, I said, my voice firmer this time. He didn't flinch. Instead, he smiled, revealing yellowed teeth, one of which was missing. Suit yourself, he said, stepping back. But he didn't leave. He just stood there watching me, his hands hanging loose at his sides, ready for anything. I started the engine, but before I could shift into gear, he lunged forward, slamming his fists against the door. The glass spiderwebbed but didn't shatter. I didn't wait to see what he'd do next. I floored the gas pedal and the truck lurched forward, kicking up gravel as I sped out of the rest area. He didn't follow, at least not right away. I kept checking the mirrors, expecting to see that old pickup barreling down on me, but it never showed. My heart was pounding, and I knew I had to get off that road and onto a main highway, somewhere with people and streetlights. But the GPS was useless and the road signs were either missing or too faded to read. I drove for what felt like hours, the trees closing in on me like a green tunnel. Then, out of nowhere, I saw headlights up ahead, two sets, parked across the road. I slowed down, realizing too late that it was a roadblock. The trucks were old, beaten-up models, just like the one that had followed me. And standing in front of them, with a baseball bat slung over his shoulder, was the same man who had tried to get into my cab. He wasn't alone. There were three others with him, all built like him, wearing the same dirty flannels and greasy jeans. They spread out across the road, blocking any chance I had of getting through. I was trapped. The man with the bat stepped forward, twirling it in his hands like it was a toy. He grinned at me, a wicked, knowing grin that sent a jolt of terror through my gut. End of the line, he called out. I wasn't armed. I never carried a gun because I didn't believe in them, 
but at that moment I wished I had one. All I had was the tire iron, and it wasn't going to do much against four guys with bats and God knows what else. But I wasn't about to give up. I shoved the tire iron into my belt and threw the truck into reverse, flooring it. The trailer jackknifed, swinging out behind me and knocking one of the men off his feet. I spun the wheel, trying to keep control as the truck careened down the narrow road, but they were on me before I could get far. The pickup truck from before roared up behind me, slamming into my trailer, trying to force me off the road. The impact jolted me hard, and I nearly lost control, but I held on, keeping the truck steady as best as I could. They weren't going to let me go that easy. I saw a side road up ahead, barely wide enough for my rig, but it was my only chance. I yanked the wheel, sending the truck skidding onto the gravel road. The pickup followed, its tires spitting dirt as it gained on me. I knew I couldn't outrun them on this terrain, not with a load this heavy. That's when I saw it, a steep incline to my right, leading down to what looked like an old quarry. It was a crazy idea, but I was out of options. I turned the wheel hard and aimed the truck toward the edge. The trailer groaned as it tipped, the weight pulling it down the slope faster than I could control. The pickup tried to follow, but the driver hesitated, giving me just enough time. The truck barreled down the incline, the tires losing traction as I fought to keep it from flipping. The quarry was filled with old machinery, rusted out and abandoned, but it offered cover, a place to hide if I could just get there. I crashed through a chain-link fence, the truck slamming into a pile of gravel and coming to a sudden, jarring stop. The seatbelt cut into my chest, and I gasped for air, trying to collect myself. I didn't have long. The pickup truck skidded to a halt at the top of the incline, and I could see the men getting out, shouting at each other, pointing down at me. I grabbed the tire iron and jumped out of the cab, my legs shaky but holding. I ran toward the machinery, ducking behind a massive conveyor belt that had seen better days. My heart was racing, but I forced myself to think. They had the numbers, but I knew the truck was more than just a weapon. It was a fortress. I heard them coming, their boots crunching on the gravel. I knew they'd split up, trying to box me in, but that was their mistake. I climbed up onto the conveyor belt, moving silently across the top, using the shadows to stay hidden. One of them passed below me, his back turned. I jumped down, swinging the tire iron with everything I had. The crack of metal against bone was sickening, but it did the job. The man crumpled to the ground, his bat rolling away uselessly. I didn't have time to think about what I'd done. The others were close. Too close. I grabbed the bat and moved toward the next one, staying low, keeping to the shadows. He didn't see me until it was too late. The bat connected with his ribs and he let out a choked gasp before collapsing. Two down, but the leader and one more were still out there. I could hear them now, their voices frantic, realizing they'd underestimated me. I stayed quiet, waiting, listening. Then I saw him, the leader, moving toward the truck, his bat raised. I knew I had to end this, and I had to do it fast. I picked up a heavy wrench from the ground and moved in behind him. He must have sensed me because he started to turn, but I was faster. The wrench caught him on the side of the head, and he went down hard. I looked around, expecting the last guy to be on me any second, but there was nothing. Just the sound of my own heavy breathing and the distant hum of the highway, miles away. I waited, every muscle tensed, but the final attack never came. I checked the bodies. They were all still there, sprawled out on the gravel. I didn't know where the fourth man had gone, but I wasn't about to stick around to find out. I climbed back into the cab, my hands shaking as I started the engine. The truck roared to life and I backed it out of the quarry, the tires struggling for traction on the loose gravel. As I drove away, I kept checking the mirrors, half expecting that last man to come after me. But there was nothing but the darkening road ahead. I didn't stop until I reached the next town, a small place with a gas station and a diner that was still open. The guy at the counter gave me a curious look as I ordered a coffee, probably wondering why I looked like I'd been through hell. I didn't offer any explanations. I just wanted to get my load delivered and get the hell out of this part of the state. And that's exactly what I did. The next day, I delivered the prefab houses, got my check, and hit the road for the next job. I didn't look back, 
and I didn't talk about what happened, not even to my dispatcher. There was no need to. The bodies would be found eventually, and when they were, it wouldn't be my problem anymore. As for the fourth man, the one who disappeared, I didn't care where he went or what he planned to do next. All that mattered was that I'd made it out alive, and that was enough for me. I hate driving at night. Most truckers I know love it because the roads are clearer and you can cover more ground without getting caught in traffic. But not me. I've had my share of weird, creepy experiences on the road, and something about the darkness just feels wrong. Maybe it's because you can't see what's ahead of you, or what's hiding in the shadows until it's too late. My name's Clyde Merrill. I've been driving trucks for nearly 20 years, hauling everything from produce to heavy machinery. It's a tough job, but it pays the bills, and it's given me a chance to see parts of the country I'd never have visited otherwise. Tonight, I was making my way through the dense forests of northern Maine, driving a route that was supposed to be an easy one, a straight shot through miles of pine trees and two-lane highways that see maybe a handful of cars each hour. The place felt like the edge of the world. It was a stretch of road where the radio signal died, and the only company you had was the occasional deer or fox darting across the road. I was supposed to drop off a load of timber at a small lumberyard in Caribou, but I'd started out later than planned, which meant I'd be driving through the night. I was about two hours from my destination, the road barely visible in my headlights, when I saw it. A massive figure sprawled across the road up ahead. At first I thought it was a moose, which wasn't uncommon around these parts. But as I got closer, I realized it wasn't an animal. It was a man, lying flat on his back, one arm twisted at an unnatural angle. His legs spread out like he'd been thrown there by something much larger. I slammed on the brakes, bringing the rig to a screeching halt just a few feet away from the body. My heart pounded in my chest, and I felt a wave of nausea. The guy looked like he'd been through hell, his clothes torn, his skin pale, and there was blood, a lot of it pooling around his head. I jumped out of the cab, my boots crunching on the gravel as I ran over to him. My first thought was to check for a pulse see if the guy was still alive, but as soon as I got close, I knew he was dead. His face was battered, one eye swollen shut, and his mouth hung open, a line of blood trickling from the corner. What the hell happened out here? I pulled out my phone, my hands trembling as I dialed 911. There was no signal. I cursed under my breath, pocketed the phone, and looked around, trying to figure out what to do next. The road was deserted, the trees on either side thick and imposing, like a wall of darkness closing in on me. There wasn't a house or a gas station for miles, and I hadn't seen another vehicle in over an hour. I glanced back at the body, and that's when I noticed the drag marks. They were faint, but visible. A trail leading from the woods to the road where the man lay. It was as if something had pulled him out of the trees and dropped him there, right in the path of oncoming traffic. A chill ran down my spine as I followed the marks with my eyes, trying to see where they led. The trail disappeared into the darkness, the trees swallowing it up, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something, or someone, was out there watching me. I took a deep breath, trying to calm my nerves. I needed to think. There was a dead guy on the road, and I had no way of calling for help. My truck wasn't going anywhere with a corpse in front of it, and there was no way in hell I was going to drag the body off the road myself. I'd seen enough horror movies to know that's how you end up as the next victim. So I did the only thing I could think of. I climbed back into the cab, locked the doors, and grabbed my flashlight. If I couldn't call for help, maybe I could signal someone. Another trucker, a state trooper, anyone who might be passing by. I flicked the switch on the flashlight and it sputtered to life, casting a weak beam of light onto the road. I held the flashlight out the window, waving it back and forth, hoping it would catch someone's attention. But as I sat there, scanning the darkness, I realized how alone I really was. There was no one else out here. Just me, the dead guy, and whatever had dragged him out of the woods. Minutes passed, and my anxiety grew with each one. 
The flashlight's beam flickered, then dimmed, and I cursed as it finally gave out. The battery was dead. I tossed it onto the passenger seat and rubbed my face, trying to figure out what to do next. Then I heard it. A rustling sound, coming from the trees. It was faint, like the wind brushing through the branches, but it was enough to make me tense up. I peered into the darkness, straining to see what was out there, but all I saw were shadows. My pulse quickened, my mind racing with possibilities. Maybe it was an animal, a deer, or a raccoon, or maybe it was something else. The rustling grew louder, closer, and I knew I couldn't just sit there and wait for whatever it was to come for me. I needed to get out of there, and fast. I turned the key in the ignition, the engine roaring to life. The truck's headlights illuminated the road, the body still lying there in front of me. I hesitated for a moment, my foot hovering over the gas pedal. I didn't want to run over the guy, but I also didn't want to stick around to see what had killed him. Before I could make up my mind, the rustling stopped. Everything went still. The only sound was the low hum of the engine and the pounding of my own heart. I gripped the steering wheel, my knuckles white, waiting for something to happen. And then it did. A figure stepped out of the trees, slowly, deliberately, like it had all the time in the world. It was a man, tall and broad-shouldered, dressed in a dirty, torn jacket and jeans. His face was hidden in shadow, but I could see that his hands were smeared with blood, the same blood that stained the body on the road. I stared at him, my mind racing. There was no way this guy was just a random passerby. He was connected to the dead man somehow, and he was coming straight for me. I floored the gas pedal, the truck lurching forward. The man didn't move, didn't even flinch as the truck bore down on him. At the last second, I swerved, the tires screeching as I veered around the body and the man. I didn't look back to see if he was still standing there. I just kept driving, my heart pounding, the road blurring beneath me as I sped away. I drove for what felt like hours, not slowing down until I saw the lights of a small diner up ahead. It was the first sign of civilization I'd seen since I'd left the lumberyard. I pulled into the parking lot, my hands shaking as I shut off the engine. I sat there for a moment, trying to catch my breath. I needed to tell someone what had happened, but who? And would they even believe me? I grabbed my phone again, praying for a signal. This time, it worked. I dialed 911, my heart pounding in my chest as the phone rang. A dispatcher answered, and I quickly explained what I'd seen, the dead man on the road, the figure that had emerged from the woods. The dispatcher listened quietly, then asked for my location. I gave it to her, and she assured me that help was on the way. But there was something in her voice, a hint of disbelief, like she wasn't sure if I was telling the truth or just another trucker with a wild imagination. I stayed in the truck, watching the road, waiting for the flashing lights of a police car. It didn't take long. A squad car pulled up a few minutes later, followed by an ambulance. The officers got out, their faces stern as they approached my truck. I told them everything, just like I'd told the dispatcher. They listened, nodding, but I could tell they didn't quite believe me. They asked me to lead them back to the spot where I'd found the body, and reluctantly, I agreed. We drove back down the dark road, the squad car following close behind. I kept my eyes on the trees, half expecting the man to step out again, but there was nothing. Just the endless stretch of road and the darkness pressing in on all sides. When we reached the spot, I slowed down, my heart sinking as I realized what was missing. The body was gone. The road was empty. No sign of the man, the drag marks, or anything else I'd seen earlier. The officers looked at me, their expressions a mix of confusion and suspicion. They asked me to step out of the truck, to retrace my steps. But there was nothing. No blood, no tracks. Nothing to prove what I'd seen. They searched the area, combing the woods with flashlights, but came up empty-handed. After a while, they called off the search, deciding it must have been a false alarm. They offered me a ride back to town, but I declined. I didn't want to leave my truck behind, not out here. As the officers drove away, I stood there by the side of the road, staring into the darkness. I knew what I'd seen. There was no way I could have imagined it. 
but without any evidence, without the body, no one would ever believe me. I climbed back into the truck, my mind racing with questions. Who was that man? And why had he taken the body? As I started the engine and pulled back onto the road, I couldn't shake the feeling that I'd just brushed up against something dark, something I wasn't supposed to see. And whatever it was, I knew it was still out there. The day started like any other. Bland coffee in a chipped mug and a half-hearted breakfast of toast and eggs that barely touched the sides. I was headed out on a routine run, another hundred miles through the dusty roads of a forgotten corner of Nevada. There's something about those roads, stretching endlessly through an empty landscape, that makes you think. My name's Wade, by the way. Wade Turner. I've been a trucker for nearly 15 years, enough time to see the sun rise and set more times than I can count, and enough time to know that not all roads lead you somewhere you want to be. This run was taking me from a warehouse in Reno to a tiny, nameless town I'd never heard of. The sort of place where the locals are suspicious of anyone who hasn't lived there for three generations, where the biggest excitement is a sale on canned beans at the local store. The load wasn't anything special. Crates of tools, some machinery parts, things that don't stand out until you realize how essential they are to the folks who need them. The first few hours were uneventful. I passed the usual landmarks, the gas station that hasn't changed its prices since the 90s, the old billboard advertising a roadside diner that probably went under a decade ago. The radio sputtered in and out of static, offering me brief snippets of country music and late-night talk shows. Eventually, the roads narrowed, and the trees closed in, turning the sky into a narrow strip of blue overhead. It was around then that I noticed the car. Old, maybe from the 70s, the kind that's more rust than paint. It had been following me for about half an hour, keeping a steady distance but never attempting to pass. Normally I wouldn't have paid it any mind. There are plenty of slow drivers out here, people who take the scenic route because they've got nowhere in particular to be. But this car... It was different. There was something off about it. The way it stayed exactly the same distance behind me, like it was tethered to my trailer. I figured it was just some paranoid feeling creeping in from too many nights spent alone on the road. Maybe the driver was just cautious, or maybe they were lost and hoping I'd lead them somewhere. I kept on driving, but my eyes kept flicking to the rearview mirror watching that old car. After another hour, I found myself on a stretch of road I didn't recognize. That's not unusual out here. GPS doesn't always get it right in these parts, and it's easy to miss a turnoff that looks just like every other dusty track. But this road... I swear it wasn't on the map. It was narrow, barely wide enough for the truck, and flanked by dense trees that blocked out the sun. The car was still behind me, its headlights now flickering in the shadows. I slowed down, hoping the driver would get the message and either pass me or turn off somewhere. But they didn't. They stayed right behind me, keeping pace as the road grew rougher, the pavement cracking and crumbling under my tires. Then I saw it. A figure standing in the middle of the road. A man, tall and broad-shouldered, dressed in dirty overalls and a battered hat. He didn't move as I approached, just stood there, watching. I hit the brakes hard, the truck shuddering to a stop just a few feet away from him. My heart was pounding, not from fear but from the suddenness of it all. I honked the horn, a long, loud blast that echoed through the trees. The man didn't flinch. He just kept staring, his face obscured by the brim of his hat. I couldn't see his eyes, but I felt them. Felt them boring into me like he could see straight through the windshield and into my soul. The car behind me had stopped too. It sat there, engine idling, as if waiting for something. I glanced back and forth between the man and the car, my mind racing. This wasn't right. Something was very, very wrong. I considered my options. I could reverse, try to back out of this nightmare road, but that would mean getting closer to the car behind me. I could step out, confront the man, but every instinct I had screamed against it. Or I could drive forward, hope that he'd move out of the way before I ran him over. 
Before I could make a decision, the man started walking toward me. Slow, deliberate steps that made my skin crawl. He had a knife in his hand. Not a gun. Not some makeshift weapon. A knife. Long and sharp. The kind that doesn't leave much room for second chances. I threw the truck into reverse, tires screeching as I tried to get away from him. The car behind me didn't budge, blocking my escape. I was trapped. The man was almost at the door now, his steps never faltering, that knife catching the weak sunlight filtering through the trees. I did the only thing I could. I floored it. The truck lunged forward, the man barely diving out of the way in time. I heard the sickening crunch as the front bumper clipped him, sending him sprawling to the side of the road. I didn't stop to see if he was getting up. I just kept going, the road twisting and turning like it wanted to throw me off. The car was still behind me, but now it was gaining. I could see the driver now, a man, his face expressionless, like he was on autopilot. There was no fear, no anger, just a blank determination that chilled me to the bone. He was forcing me forward, deeper into whatever trap they had set. And then, just as suddenly as it had begun, it was over. The road opened up, the trees thinning to reveal an old gas station, long abandoned and rotting away. The car behind me swerved off, disappearing into the woods, and I slammed the brakes, bringing the truck to a halt in the dirt lot. My hands were shaking as I killed the engine, trying to make sense of what had just happened. I stumbled out of the cab, looking around for any sign of the man or the car, but there was nothing. Just the silence of the woods, the distant rustling of leaves. That's when I noticed the blood. It was splattered across the front of the truck, thick and dark, still fresh. But there was no body, no sign of the man I had hit. Just the blood, proof that he had been there, that this wasn't some twisted dream. I fumbled for my phone, dialing 911 with trembling fingers. When the operator answered, I blurted out everything, about the man, the car, the blood. She tried to calm me down, told me to stay where I was and that help was on the way. I waited for what felt like hours, staring at the road, half expecting that car to reappear, for the man to come out of the woods, knife in hand. But all that came was a single police cruiser, its lights cutting through the early evening gloom. The officer was a young guy, barely older than a kid. He listened to my story, his expression growing more skeptical by the minute. He checked the truck, saw the blood, but there was nothing more he could do. No body, no witnesses, just my word against the silence of the woods. You're lucky, he said finally, closing his notebook. Could have been worse, could have been dead out here. Yeah, I muttered, staring at the blood stains. Could have been. He drove off, leaving me alone with the truck. I didn't move for a long time. Just sat there, trying to figure out what the hell had just happened. Eventually I got back in, started the engine, and drove away. I made it to that nameless town by nightfall, delivered the load, and got the hell out of there. I don't know who those men were or why they picked me. All I know is that I'm still here, still driving still waiting for the next job to take me down another forgotten road. And the blood... Well, I never did get it all off. I hadn't planned on spending the night in West Quincy, Missouri, but life's got a way of detouring your plans, especially when you're a trucker. My name's Virgil Hayes, and I've been hauling goods across the country for the better part of 20 years. I'm not the kind of guy who's easily shaken, but that night in West Quincy, well, that was something else. I was on a long haul from Chicago to Kansas City with a trailer full of electronics. My old freight liner was running like a dream, so I figured I'd make it a few hours past Hannibal before calling it a night. The forecast had been clear, and the roads weren't bad for once. But as I crossed the Mississippi into Missouri, my plans unraveled. There's a truck stop in West Quincy, a rundown place, barely a blip on the map, but it's got cheap diesel and a diner that serves half-decent coffee. I wasn't planning on stopping, but my rig started acting up, sputtering and groaning like it was about to give out on me. 
I pulled into the lot, figuring I'd check under the hood and grab a cup of joe while I was at it. The place was nearly empty, which wasn't surprising for the time of night. A couple of trucks were parked near the far end of the lot, but other than that, it was just me and the fluorescent lights buzzing above the fuel pumps. I parked near the entrance and hopped out, the chilly night air hitting me as I slammed the door shut. Popping the hood, I leaned in, hoping it was just a loose connection or something simple. I was no mechanic, but I knew my rig well enough to troubleshoot the basics. But as I fumbled with a flashlight in one hand and a wrench in the other, I noticed something odd. An old, beat-up pickup parked near the diner. It hadn't been there when I pulled in, and there wasn't anyone in sight. Probably just someone grabbing a bite, I muttered to myself, shaking off the unease that was creeping up my spine. I finished up under the hood, finding nothing obviously wrong, and decided to head inside for that coffee. The diner was dimly lit, with a single waitress wiping down the counter. She looked up as I walked in, giving me a nod before returning to her work. The place had a greasy, stale smell to it, like old fries and burnt coffee, but it was warm, and that was good enough for me. I ordered a cup to go and chatted with the waitress while she poured it. Her name was Marlene, and she had that kind of tired look you see in people who've been doing the same job for too many years. We talk it about the weather, the road conditions, nothing special, but then she asked something that caught me off guard. You driving alone tonic, she asked, her voice a little too casual. Yeah, why? I responded, my gut telling me something wasn't right. Just be careful out there, she said, her eyes flicking toward the window. There's been some trouble around here lately. A couple of truckers went missing last month. Cops didn't find much except their rigs, empty and abandoned. I frowned, not liking where this was going. What kind of trouble? She hesitated as if she was about to say something more, but then thought better of it. Just be careful, okay? I nodded, taking my coffee and heading back to the truck. Marlene's warning was still on my mind as I climbed into the cab. The lot was just as empty as before, except for that pickup, which now had its lights on. I could see the silhouette of a man sitting behind the wheel, but he didn't move as I started the engine. I tried to shake off the feeling of being watched. It was just a guy in a truck, probably another traveler trying to catch some sleep. I pulled out of the lot and headed back onto the highway, but the pickup didn't follow. Still, the road ahead felt darker, more ominous than before. About 15 miles down the road, my freight liner started acting up again. This time it wasn't just a sputter, it was a full-on breakdown. The engine coughed, sputtered, and then died, leaving me coasting to a stop on the shoulder. I cursed under my breath, grabbing the flashlight and stepping out into the night. The nearest town was miles away, and my phone had no signal. I was kneeling by the engine, trying to figure out what the hell had gone wrong, when I heard it. The distinct sound of tires on gravel. I turned, and there it was, the same beat-up pickup from the diner, pulling up behind my rig. The headlights were blinding, and I had to shield my eyes as the driver's door opened. A man stepped out, tall and broad-shouldered, his face obscured by the glare. He didn't say a word, just started walking toward me with a slow, deliberate stride. There was something off about him. His movements were too fluid, too calculated, like he knew exactly what he was doing and how it would end. Need some help? he asked his voice low and devoid of any real concern. I shook my head, trying to keep my voice steady. Nah, I got it. Just a minor issue, I think. He didn't stop. He kept coming, his shadow stretching long in the headlights. I could make out more details now. Greasy hair that hung limply around his face, a worn leather jacket that looked two sizes too big, and hands that were too clean for someone driving a beat-up truck. Something wasn't right. My instinct screamed at me to get back in the cab, to lock the doors and floor it. But the Freightliner was dead, and my chances of outrunning him on foot were slim. I stood my ground, hoping he'd take the hint and leave. But he didn't. He just smiled, a cold, humorless grin that didn't reach his eyes. Eyes I never wanted to see up close. 
You sure about that? Yeah, I said, trying to sound confident. Just leave me be. He stopped a few feet away, his gaze drifting to the trailer hitched to my rig. Hauling something valuable? Nothing worth your time, I replied, stepping back. He nodded slowly, as if considering something. Then, without warning, he lunged forward, grabbing me by the collar and slamming me against the side of the truck. I tried to fight back, but he was stronger than he looked, and before I knew it, he had me pinned. I've been watching you, he said, his voice calm and detached. Been following you since Hannibal. You truckers think you're invincible out here on the open road. But you're not. You're just easy targets. I struggled against his grip, my heart pounding in my chest. What do you want? He leaned in closer, his breath hot against my ear. I want what you've got in that trailer. And I want you to suffer for making it so easy. Panic surged through me, but before I could react, he slammed my head against the truck again, and everything went dark. When I came to, I was lying on the gravel, my hands bound behind my back with what felt like duct tape. The man was rifling through my cab, tossing things out as he searched for something. My vision was blurry, but I could see him clearly enough to know he wasn't just after the electronics. He found my wallet and phone, pocketing them before moving to the back of the truck. I tried to twist around to see what he was doing, but the tape held me tight. All I could do was listen as he worked, opening the trailer and rummaging through the cargo. Then I heard a sound that chilled me to the bone, the sharp crack of a knife slicing through something, followed by a low grunt of satisfaction. He was cutting through the straps that held the crates in place, probably planning to offload the goods and take off before anyone noticed. I had to do something. If I didn't, I was as good as dead. With every ounce of strength, I had left. I rolled onto my side and started working at the tape with the edge of the gravel. It was slow, agonizing work, but I didn't stop. I couldn't. My hands were slick with blood from where the tape had cut into my wrists. But finally, after what felt like an eternity, I got one hand free. I pulled the tape off the other hand and scrambled to my feet, my legs shaking. The man was still at the back of the truck, his back turned to me as he loaded a crate into the bed of his pickup. I didn't think, I just acted. There was a tire iron lying near the cab and I grabbed it, charging at him with everything I had. He turned just in time to see me swing, the iron connecting with his shoulder. He staggered back, more surprised than hurt, and I took the opportunity to swing again, this time aiming for his head. The impact was sickening, the crack of bone and metal echoing in the night. He crumpled to the ground, the knife slipping from his hand. I stood over him, breathing hard, the tire iron still clenched in my fists. He wasn't moving. I dropped the tire iron, my hands trembling as I fumbled for my phone in his pocket. It was cracked, but it still worked. I dialed 911, my voice shaking as I told the operator what had happened. They said help was on the way, but I wasn't sure if I believed them. I stayed on the line until I heard the sirens in the distance. The police arrived minutes later, but it felt like hours. They found me standing over the man's body, the bloodied tire iron at my feet. They took him away in a body bag and took me to the station for questioning. In the end, they believed me. The man was a wanted criminal, responsible for the disappearances of several truckers in the area. They found evidence in his pickup, wallets, IDs, even a few personal items from the other victims. He'd been targeting drivers on this stretch of highway for months, using the same M.O. every time. As they processed the scene, I sat on the tailgate of my rig, staring at the flashing lights. The sun was just starting to rise, casting a pale glow over the lot. The police told me I could go, that I'd done the right thing, but all I could think about was getting back on the road. So I did. I climbed back into my cab, started the engine, and drove off, leaving West Quincy behind. The roads were empty, the sky clear. And as the miles passed under my wheels, I found myself thinking about the other truckers who hadn't been so lucky. I never saw Marlene again and I never stopped in West Quincy after that. But I kept driving, because that's what I do. Life on the road doesn't give you time to dwell on the past. It just keeps moving, 
one mile at a time. Truck driving has always been in my blood. My father did it, my grandfather too, and now here I am, a third generation road warrior. There's something about the open road, the hum of the engine beneath me, and the miles slipping by like a well-worn path that always drew me in. But if there's one thing I've learned from years behind the wheel, it's that no two days are ever the same. That's how it started, a routine haul through backcountry roads that most drivers would avoid. I'm not most drivers. My rig, a beat-up old Peterbilt I'd named Betsy, had seen better days, but she was reliable. We were cutting across a desolate stretch of highway somewhere in northern Nevada, about as middle of nowhere as you could get in this country. No cell service, no signs of life for miles, just the road, the mountains, and the endless desert stretching out in every direction. It was just past midnight, the darkness pressing in around the cab like a suffocating blanket. The road had been empty for hours, the only light coming from Betsy's headlights slicing through the blackness ahead. The radio, tuned to some classic rock station, crackled with static. I didn't mind. The noise was comforting. My thoughts were on the delivery I had to make by dawn, a load of machinery parts to a mining town no one's ever heard of when I saw him. He was standing on the side of the road, a hitchhiker, or so I thought at first. Tall, lean, dressed in jeans and a dark jacket, with a baseball cap pulled low over his face. His thumb was out and I could see his breath in the cool night air. It was a weird place to be hitching a ride, but not the weirdest thing I'd seen on these roads. I slowed Betsy down, debating whether to pull over. There was something off about the guy. Maybe it was the way he was standing, too still, like he was carved out of the landscape. Or maybe it was the way he didn't seem surprised to see a truck coming his way on a road that was usually dead quiet at this hour. But then I figured, hell, Maybe he's just another lost soul looking to get somewhere, and I was the only chance he had. I pulled over, the air brakes hissing like a rattlesnake. He didn't move at first, just kept staring at the truck. I leaned over and opened the passenger door. Where are you headed? I called out. He stepped closer, but he didn't answer. The light from the cab caught his face as he climbed up, and that's when I noticed it. His face was thin, almost gaunt, like he hadn't eaten in days. His skin was pale, but not sickly, more like he just didn't belong under the harsh sun of the Nevada desert. His eyes, damn, I didn't want to look at them. But there was something in them, something cold and empty, like a void. I shook it off and told myself I was being paranoid. Thanks, he muttered, his voice low and gravelly, like he hadn't spoken in a while. He slid into the seat and shut the door, the sound echoing in the silence. The guy didn't offer a name and I didn't ask. I just put Betsy back in gear and got us moving again. We rode in silence for a while, just the sound of the engine and the road beneath us. I tried to make small talk, asked him where he was coming from, where he was headed, but he gave me nothing. He just sat there, staring straight ahead, his hands clasped together in his lap. The guy had this unsettling presence, something that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I couldn't put my finger on it, but there was something deeply wrong with him. The road twisted and turned through the mountains, and the longer we drove, the more I started to feel uneasy. I've had my fair share of sketchy passengers before, but this guy was different. There was no anger, no aggression, just a cold emptiness that made my skin crawl. I kept my eyes on the road, but I could feel his gaze on me, like he was studying me, waiting for something. About an hour in, I decided enough was enough. There was a small rest stop coming up, just a dilapidated old gas station with a flickering neon sign. I figured I'd drop him off there and get on with my night. I didn't care where he was going, as long as he was out of my truck. We're stopping up ahead, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. You can catch another ride from here. For the first time since he got in, he turned to look at me. His expression didn't change, but there was something in his eyes that made my stomach knot. I don't think so, he said quietly. That was it. Two seconds, and I'd had enough. 
I pulled Betsy off the road, the tires crunching over gravel as we came to a stop in the rest stop parking lot. The place was deserted, not a soul in sight. Perfect. You're getting out, I said, more forcefully this time, reaching over to open the passenger door. Now. But he didn't move. He just sat there, staring at me with those cold, dead eyes. Then he smiled, a slow, deliberate smile that sent a chill down my spine. Do you really think you can just drop me off? He asked, his voice soft but menacing, like I'm some kind of stray dog. I felt my pulse quicken. This was bad. Really bad. I had no idea who this guy was, but he wasn't just some hitchhiker. Something told me I'd made a big mistake letting him into my truck. I reached under my seat, where I kept a tire iron for emergencies, and pulled it out, brandishing it like a weapon. I said, Get out. Now. The man's smile widened. He didn't even flinch. Go ahead, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. Try it. I didn't think. I just swung. The tire iron connected with his shoulder, and I expected him to crumple, to feel pain, something. But he didn't even budge. Instead, he grabbed the tire iron mid-swing and wrenched it from my hands with impossible strength. My heart pounded as he leaned in closer, his face inches from mine. I don't think you understand, he said, his voice a whisper of steel. You're not in control here. The fear that had been simmering inside me boiled over. I shoved the door open and jumped out of the truck, the cold night air hitting me like a slap. I turned, ready to run, but I heard the door of the truck creak open behind me. He was coming after me. I didn't waste any time. I bolted toward the gas station, hoping against hope that the door was unlocked. My feet pounded the pavement as I reached the entrance, my fingers scrabbling for the handle. It opened, thank God, and I burst inside, slamming the door shut behind me. I turned around, panting, expecting him to be right there, but the parking lot was empty. The truck was still there, the door hanging open, but he was gone. Vanished. My mind raced, trying to make sense of what had just happened. I stayed in that gas station for what felt like hours, crouched behind the counter, my heart racing, waiting for him to come bursting in. But he never did. When I finally gathered the courage to look outside, there was no sign of him. I didn't go back to the truck right away. I wasn't sure I ever wanted to get back in Betsy again. But eventually, I had no choice. The delivery had to be made, and I wasn't about to let some psycho ruin my reputation. When I finally climbed back into the cab, everything was as I'd left it, except for one thing. On the passenger seat where the guy had been sitting was the tire iron, bent, twisted out of shape, like it had been crushed by a machine. I never saw him again, and I never took that route again. Maybe it was just a fluke, a one-time thing, or maybe I'd crossed paths with something, someone, I was never meant to understand. All I know is, I'm a little more careful about who I pick up on the road these days, and that's the last time I let a hitchhiker into my truck. The night had already settled in, cloaking the rolling hills in a deep, impenetrable blackness, when I found myself driving along a forgotten highway in the heart of Kentucky. It was one of those roads you only take when your GPS has led you astray, winding through the countryside, away from the main interstates. There was nothing around for miles. No streetlights, no towns, just the occasional distant farmhouse, its light a flickering beacon of false hope. My name's Dennis Haverford. I've been driving trucks for close to 12 years now, long enough to have stories that could fill a dozen leather-bound journals. But this one, this one's different. I'm not one for dramatics, so you'll have to take my word when I say that what happened that night was unlike anything I've ever encountered. I'd been on the road for about six hours straight, hauling a load of lumber to a small construction site on the outskirts of Louisville. It was supposed to be an easy job, a straight shot with minimal fuss. But the universe has a way of throwing curveballs when you least expect them. The route took me off the main highway and onto a back road that barely seemed wide enough for my rig. 
The pavement was cracked and overgrown with weeds, and the GPS had long since lost its signal. But I kept going, figuring I'd hit a main road again soon enough. There was something oddly peaceful about the solitude, the way the truck's headlights carved a path through the darkness, illuminating nothing but endless asphalt and the occasional road sign. Then, I saw him. At first, I thought it was just another sign, or maybe a deer, its body frozen in the beam of my headlights. But as I drew closer, I realized it was a man, standing dead center in the road, arms hanging limply at his sides. I hit the brakes, the truck groaning in protest as it came to a shuddering stop. He didn't move, just stood there, staring at the truck, his face a mask of indifference. The guy was tall, well over six feet, with a build that suggested he could do some serious damage if he wanted to. He wore a stained white t-shirt, the kind that looked like it hadn't seen a washing machine in years, and a pair of jeans that were equally as grimy. His face was gaunt, unshaven, with deep lines etched into his skin, and his hair, greasy and matted, hung over his forehead in uneven clumps. I rolled down the window, the night air rushing in, carrying with it the earthy scent of wet soil. You okay, buddy? I called out, keeping my voice steady, though every instinct screamed at me to get the hell out of there. He didn't respond. Just stood there, eyes locked on mine. There was something off about his expression, like he was looking through me, not at me. A chill ran down my spine, and I felt a knot tighten in my gut. Need a ride? I asked even though the thought of him getting in the truck with me made my skin crawl. But what else could I do? Leave him out there in the middle of nowhere? He took a step forward, his movements slow and deliberate. I could see him more clearly now. His clothes were soaked, not with water, but with something darker, something that glistened wetly in the light. Blood. A lot of it. My hand instinctively reached for the door handle, ready to slam it shut and hit the gas. Stop right there, I said, my voice firm. What the hell happened to you? He ignored me, continuing to walk towards the truck. I could see his hands now, large, calloused, but coated in blood, as if he'd been wrist deep in something gruesome. I caught a glimpse of something metallic in his right hand, a knife, its blade long and serrated, dripping with what I could only assume was more blood. That's when the panic set in. I slammed the truck into reverse, tires screeching against the pavement as I backed up, trying to put some distance between us. He broke into a sprint, his legs pumping furiously as he chased after me, the knife glinting in the light. Shit! I cursed, throwing the truck into drive and slamming on the accelerator. The engine roared as I sped down the road, the man a dark silhouette in my rearview mirror shrinking into the distance. But even as he disappeared from view, I couldn't shake the feeling that he wasn't done with me yet. I drove for what felt like hours, my eyes darting between the road and the mirrors, half expecting him to reappear at any moment. The road twisted and turned, leading me deeper into the wilderness, away from civilization. Every shadow seemed to shift, every noise amplified by the deafening silence of the night. Finally I saw it. A gas station its neon sign flickering like a dying firefly in the distance. Relief washed over me as I pulled into the parking lot, the bright lights a welcome reprieve from the darkness. I parked the truck and jumped out, heading straight for the building. The attendant was an older guy, probably in his late sixties, with a grizzled beard and a baseball cap pulled low over his eyes. He looked up from his magazine as I burst through the door, breathless and wild-eyed. You okay, son? he asked, his voice a gravelly drawl. There's a guy out there, I panted, covered in blood. He was chasing me with a knife. The attendant raised an eyebrow, his expression shifting from concern to skepticism. You sure about that? Ain't nobody come through here all night. I'm telling you he was there, I insisted, my hands trembling. Out on the highway, just standing in the middle of the road. He sighed, setting his magazine aside and reaching for a shotgun mounted on the wall behind the counter. All right, let's take a look. We stepped outside, the cold air biting at my skin. I scanned the area, 
expecting to see the man lurking in the shadows, but there was nothing. Just the quiet hum of the gas station's lights and the distant chirping of crickets. Where'd you say you saw him? The attendant asked, cocking the shotgun. Back on the highway about ten miles from here, I said, my voice wavering. He was covered in blood. There's no way he just vanished. The old man nodded, his gaze sweeping the darkness. These parts are quiet, son. Ain't much that happens here. If there was a man out there like you said, I reckon he's long gone by now. I wanted to argue, to make him understand the danger, but something in his eyes told me it was pointless. He'd seen enough in his time to know when a man was telling the truth and when he was just spooked by his own imagination. I wasn't about to be dismissed as some lunatic trucker. Stay here for a bit if you want, he offered, lowering the shotgun. Get your bearings. Ain't no rush to get back on the road. I nodded, grateful for the offer. I parked my truck on the side of the building and sat in the small diner attached to the station, nursing a cup of stale coffee and staring out the window. Every so often, I'd glance at the door, half expecting the man to burst in, knife in hand. But he never came. It wasn't until the sun began to rise, casting the world in a dull gray light, that I felt a semblance of safety. The night had been long and terrifying, but it was over. I finished my coffee, thanked the attendant, and headed back to my truck. As I climbed into the cab, I noticed something that made my blood run cold. A streak of red smeared across the door handle. Blood. Fresh and still wet. I didn't waste time. I started the truck, my hands shaking as I pulled out of the parking lot and headed back towards the main road. I didn't stop driving until I reached the construction site, miles away from that desolate stretch of highway. Later, when the police arrived to inspect the truck, they found the streak of blood on the door confirming my story. They also found something else. A knife. The blade caked with dried blood, lodged in the back of the cab where I hadn't noticed it. The old man at the gas station was right. These parts were quiet. But that night, they had been anything but. I finished my delivery and left Kentucky as fast as I could, never looking back. And as for the man on the road, I don't know where he went or what happened to him after I sped away. But sometimes, when I'm driving late at night, I catch myself checking the mirrors, just in case. It started like any other day on the road. I was halfway through a three-day haul, crossing through the less-traveled roads of northern Idaho. I'd been a trucker for almost 20 years, and I preferred these remote routes. Less traffic, less stress, just me and the long stretch of asphalt. My name's Joel Weaver, but most folks just call me Weave. I don't mind the solitude. It gives me time to think, and besides, the job's simple. Get the load from point A to point B. But this trip... This trip was different. I was driving through the Clearwater National Forest, a place thick with trees and not much else. There were no cell towers, no towns, just miles of dense forest that could swallow a man whole. The radio signal was weak, so I turned it off and focused on the road. The only sounds were the hum of my engine and the tires rolling over the worn pavement. It was peaceful, but there was an undercurrent of something unsettling, something I couldn't quite place. About 50 miles into the forest, I saw a figure on the side of the road. Now, it's not uncommon to see folks out here, hunters, hikers, or the occasional stranded driver. But this guy stood out. He was tall, well over six feet, with a lean, wiry build. His clothes were dirty, jeans, and a dark jacket that looked too warm for the weather. What caught my eye was the way he stood there, stock still, staring at my rig as I approached. I slowed down out of habit. Maybe he needed help. As I got closer, I noticed his face. It was gaunt, almost skeletal, with a few days' worth of stubble that looked more like patches of dirt. His hair was dark, matted, and greasy. But his eyes... No. Scratch that, I couldn't see his eyes. The brim of his cap cast a shadow over them, making his face look hollow. He didn't wave, didn't signal that he needed anything just stared at me with a fixed intensity that sent a shiver down my spine. I passed him by, deciding not to stop. Something about him didn't sit right with me. 
I'd seen a lot of folks out here in the middle of nowhere, but this guy... He was different. I couldn't shake the feeling that he was trouble. About five miles down the road, I spotted something else. A pickup truck, old and rusted, was pulled off on the shoulder, nose down in a shallow ditch. It looked like it had been there for a while, weeds growing up around the tires. I slowed down again, scanning the area for any sign of the driver. Nothing. The truck was empty, abandoned. Maybe it belonged to the guy I'd seen earlier, but why would he leave it and just stand by the road like that? I decided to keep moving. This wasn't my problem, and I had a schedule to keep. But as I drove on, that sense of unease grew stronger. I couldn't stop thinking about that man and the truck. Something wasn't adding up. The road wound deeper into the forest, and the sky began to darken with the coming dusk. I kept an eye on my mirrors, half expecting to see that guy again, but the road behind me was empty, just me and the trees. Then, about 20 miles later, I noticed something strange. My fuel gauge was dropping faster than it should have been. I knew I had enough to get to the next town, but now I wasn't so sure. I decided to pull over and check things out. I found a wide shoulder and eased my rig onto it. The engine rumbled as I stepped out, grabbing a flashlight from the cab. The air was thick with the smell of pine and earth, the kind of smell that would usually calm me. But not today. I walked around to the side of the truck, shining the light along the fuel tank. No leaks, nothing unusual. But then I noticed something strange. The cap on the tank was loose, barely hanging on. I hadn't touched it since I filled up hours ago. Someone had tampered with it. I felt a chill creep up my spine. Was it that guy? Had he followed me somehow? The thought was crazy, but I couldn't shake it. I tightened the cap, double-checked the rest of the truck, and climbed back into the cab. I locked the doors, something I rarely bothered to do, and started the engine. I drove on, but now I was on edge. Every shadow in the trees seemed to move. Every noise in the cab felt amplified. My eyes flicked to the mirrors constantly, half expecting to see someone creeping up behind me. But the road was empty, just as it had been. About an hour later, I reached a small, run-down truck stop on the edge of the forest. It was the kind of place you'd only stop at if you were desperate. The lights flickered, and the sign was half-broken, but it was the only place for miles, so I pulled in. The place was deserted, not another vehicle in sight. I filled up the tank, paid at the pump, and decided to take a quick break. The place had a small diner attached, and I figured a cup of coffee might calm my nerves. As I walked toward the entrance, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I stopped, turned around, but there was nothing, just the empty lot and my rig. Inside, the diner was as run down as the outside. A tired-looking waitress stood behind the counter, her uniform wrinkled and stained. She looked up as I entered, giving me a nod. Coffee? She asked, her voice flat. Yeah, black, I replied, taking a seat at the counter. She poured the coffee and slid it over to me. I took a sip, hoping it would steady my nerves, but it was bitter and lukewarm. I forced it down anyway, trying to focus on anything but the creeping unease in my gut. The door creaked open behind me and I glanced over my shoulder. A man walked in, tall and lean, wearing a dark jacket and a dirty cap. It was him the guy from the road. My heart skipped a beat and I instinctively reached for the knife I kept clipped to my belt. He didn't look at me, just walked past and took a seat at the far end of the counter. The waitress didn't seem to notice him, she just went back to wiping down the counter. I watched him out of the corner of my eye, my hand gripping the knife handle under the table. He sat there, not moving, not ordering anything, just sitting. The tension in the room was palpable and I could feel the sweat forming on the back of my neck. My mind raced, trying to figure out what to do. I couldn't just sit here. I had to do something, but what? Call the cops? Leave? Confront him? Before I could decide, he stood up and walked out, just as silently as he'd come in. I waited a few moments, then got up and followed him outside. 
My truck was still parked where I left it, but the lot was dark, the only light coming from the flickering sign. I didn't see him anywhere. I hurried to my rig, climbed inside, and locked the doors again. I started the engine, ready to get the hell out of there, but then I saw him. He was standing at the edge of the lot, just beyond the reach of the lights, staring at me. My breath caught in my throat. How did he get there so fast? I threw the truck into gear and pulled out of the lot, my tires kicking up gravel as I sped away. My heart pounded in my chest, and I kept checking the mirrors, expecting to see him following me. But the road behind me was empty again. I drove for hours, not daring to stop, not even when I got to the next town. I just kept going until I crossed into Montana. By then, it was well past midnight, and I was running on fumes. I finally pulled into a rest area parked under the bright lights and sat there, trying to calm down. I never saw him again. I don't know who he was, what he wanted, or how he kept showing up like that. But I know one thing. I'm never taking that route again. As I climbed out of the cab, I noticed something caught in the side mirror. It was a dirty baseball cap, the same one the man had been wearing. It was hanging on a tree branch just behind the truck, flapping in the wind. I left it there, drove off, and never looked back. The day started like any other. I was driving down the quiet, desolate highways of West Texas, miles away from the nearest town, with nothing but the empty plains stretching out on either side. My rig, a 15-year-old Peterbilt that had seen better days, groaned under the weight of the cargo. The dashboard rattled, and I kept one hand steady on the wheel while the other fiddled with the radio, searching for anything that might break the monotony of the static. My name's Victor Harlan, and I've been a trucker for 20 years. I've hauled everything from produce to livestock, but today it was a load of steel girders destined for a construction site somewhere in the middle of nowhere. I'm a simple guy, nothing fancy. I prefer a quiet life, mostly just me and the road. But even after all these years, you still get the occasional bad feeling, that sixth sense whispering that something's off. And today that feeling had been gnawing at me since I left the depot. Around noon, I pulled into a small rest area. It was one of those places that seemed to exist purely out of some bureaucratic obligation rather than necessity. Just a patch of gravel and a couple of rusty picnic tables. I needed to stretch my legs, and more importantly, check the straps on the load. They had a tendency to loosen on these long stretches of road, especially with the way the truck shook on the old, cracked asphalt. As I stepped out of the cab, the heat hit me like a brick wall. The sun beat down relentlessly, making the air shimmer above the ground. I wiped the sweat off my brow and did a quick walk around, tugging on the straps and checking the tires. Everything seemed in order. There was no one else around. Just me, the wind, and the faint buzz of flies. I was about to climb back into the cab when I saw something odd. A figure in the distance, maybe a hundred yards off, standing by the edge of the highway. The man was tall, with a wide frame, dressed in dirty work clothes that hung loose on his frame, and a baseball cap pulled low over his face. I couldn't see his features clearly from where I was, but something about the way he stood there, unmoving, sent a chill down my spine. Hey, I called out, waving an arm. You all right? He didn't respond. Just stood there, facing me. The sun was in my eyes, making it hard to see, but I could tell he was staring right at me. <laughs> the longer he stood there, the more uncomfortable I felt, like I was being sized up by a predator. I turned back to my truck, and when I looked again, he was gone. Just disappeared into thin air. I blinked, shook my head, and chalked it up to the heat. But that uneasy feeling wouldn't let go. Back on the road, the miles ticked by, and I tried to push the incident out of my mind. But I couldn't shake the image of that man, standing so still, staring at me. I kept glancing in my rearview mirrors, half expecting to see him in the distance, following me. It was late afternoon when I spotted something ahead, a pickup truck, overturned on the side of the road. I slowed down as I approached, my instincts telling me to be cautious. 
There were no other vehicles around, and no sign of whoever might have been driving it. I stopped the rig a few yards away and grabbed my flashlight from the glove box, stepping out of the cab with a sense of trepidation. The wind had picked up, carrying with it the scent of dust and dry grass. The pickup was an old, beat-up Ford, its cab crumpled from the impact. The windshield was shattered, and the driver's door hung open, creaking softly in the wind. Hello? I called out, but there was no response. I approached slowly, the flashlight beam cutting through the dimming light. The interior was empty, no sign of blood or any struggle, just a lone boot lying on the floor of the passenger side. It didn't sit right with me. Accidents like this don't just happen without a cause, and the state of the pickup suggested a violent crash. But there were no skid marks, no sign of another vehicle, nothing. I circled around the truck, checking the area for any sign of the driver. That's when I noticed the footprints. They were deep, heading away from the wreck and into the brush alongside the road. The prints were wide, made by heavy boots, and the stride was long. They didn't look like the kind of tracks left by someone injured or dazed from a crash. They looked deliberate. I hesitated. Every instinct told me to get back in the truck and drive, to leave this mess for the authorities. But something pulled me forward. Maybe it was curiosity, or maybe just the sense that I couldn't leave someone out there, possibly hurt, without at least trying to help. The tracks led me about fifty yards from the road to where the brush opened up into a small clearing. And there, slumped against a rock, was a body. A man, dressed in jeans and a flannel shirt, his face obscured by a thick beard and a mop of unkempt hair. I couldn't tell how long he'd been there, but he wasn't moving. Hey, I said softly, as I crouched beside him, reaching out to check for a pulse. The skin was cold to the touch, and as I leaned in closer, I saw the cause, a deep, jagged wound across his throat, dried blood staining his shirt and the ground beneath him. My heart skipped a beat. This wasn't just an accident. This man had been murdered. I stood up quickly, my mind racing. Whoever did this could still be around. I needed to get out of here, call the cops, let them handle it. But as I turned to leave, something caught my eye. There, on the other side of the clearing, standing just at the edge of the brush, was the same man I'd seen earlier at the rest stop. He was closer now, and I could see him more clearly. His face was rugged, with a square jaw and skin weathered by the sun. His clothes were covered in dirt and blood, and his hands were large, rough, the kind that spoke of hard labor. He didn't say a word, just watched me with an intensity that made my blood run cold. I didn't wait to see what he'd do. I bolted, sprinting back towards my truck, my breath coming in ragged gasps. I could hear his heavy footsteps behind me, gaining ground with every second. Panic surged through me as I reached the highway, my truck just a few yards away. I dove into the cab, slamming the door shut and locking it in one fluid motion. My hands were shaking as I fumbled for the keys, shoving them into the ignition. The engine roared to life and I floored it, the tires kicking up gravel as I sped away. In the rearview mirror I saw the man standing in the middle of the road, his figure growing smaller as I put distance between us. But I didn't slow down. I kept driving the adrenaline pumping through my veins. It wasn't until I was miles down the road, the sun setting behind me, that I dared to take a breath. My mind was racing, trying to make sense of what had just happened. That man had killed someone, and he'd been right there watching me, as if daring me to do something about it. But as I drove, I noticed something strange. The road was empty, not a single car in sight. It was like I was the only person left on this stretch of highway. The unease settled back into my gut. It was dark by the time I reached the small town where I was supposed to deliver the steel girders. I pulled into the yard, my nerves still on edge, and quickly unhooked the trailer, eager to be done with it. I parked the rig by the office and went inside to get the paperwork signed. The guy behind the counter was a middle-aged man with a thick mustache reading a magazine. He looked up as I entered, raising an eyebrow at my disheveled state. "'You all right, buddy?' he asked. I handed him the papers, trying to keep my voice steady. Ran into some trouble on the road. Saw a wreck a few miles back. Looked bad. 
He glanced at me, then at the paperwork. Yeah? You call it in? Didn't get a chance. Thought I'd get here first, then make the call. He nodded, seemingly uninterested, and went back to processing the documents. I felt a strange mix of relief and irritation at his nonchalance. But I didn't care. I just wanted to finish up and get out of there. When he handed me back the signed papers, he paused. You said there was a wreck? What kind of vehicle? Old pickup. Blue Ford, I think. Overturned near mile marker 116. His expression changed slightly, a shadow of concern crossing his face. You sure? Yeah. Why? He leaned forward, lowering his voice. That marker's a ways back. There was a crash there a couple weeks ago. Guy got killed, found in the brush, but they cleared the scene. No way there's still a wreck there. I stared at him, my mind reeling. I saw it. I saw the truck, the body, everything. He frowned, then shrugged, as if dismissing the whole thing. Maybe you're mistaken, but if you're sure, you should call it in. I didn't argue. I left the office, my hands still trembling slightly as I dialed 911. I gave them the details, the location, everything I'd seen. They said they'd send someone out to check, but I didn't stay to find out what they found. As I climbed back into my truck, I glanced into the darkness, half expecting to see that man standing there, waiting. But there was nothing. Just the empty lot, the quiet hum of the town in the distance. I didn't wait around. I started the engine and drove off, eager to put as much distance between me and that highway as possible. The night swallowed me up as I headed for the next town, the headlights cutting through the dark, lonely road ahead. I didn't know what I'd seen or what really happened back there, but I was glad to be away from it. The night stretched on, the miles ticking by as the highway unfurled before me, endless and empty. I focused on the road, trying to push the events of the day out of my mind. But some things stick with you, no matter how far you drive.